In this first example, the investigators focused on reporting breast cancer pathological differences and similarities among women from different racial and ethnic groups. They examined a large US data can a cancer database, and they included data from women who were diagnosed with breast cancer from 2004 to 2011. From that large cohort or sample, 70% of the women were non-white. Upon looking at the characteristics of women with stage one cancer from that sample, we see that in, at this lowest stage of breast cancer, black women had the lowest prevalence, that is with 37%. The authors also reported that death at this stage of breast cancer was very low. However, it was double the rate among a black women. They did not uh, uh, observe any differences in annual income. So with this information, can we say that there are any health or healthcare disparities? We don't know yet. Let's look at more information. In this other table, the investigators are illustrating the prevalence of stage four breast cancer, which is the most advanced stage, and particularly or specifically women who have stage four, but the tumors are small or less than two centimeters in size. And what they observed was that although the prevalence of this specific phenotype or cluster of characteristics of breast cancer, black women had the highest prevalence among all women. Not only that, they also looked at whether the, the, the women had positive nodes. And that's a, an indicator of metastasis. And black women had the highest prevalence of this type of presentation. They also looked at whether the tumors had estrogen receptors or they were triple negative receptors. And most of the, the I'm sorry, the, the prevalence of the tumors with estrogen receptor in this group in black women was the lowest and triple negative was the highest among all women. These two last indicators um, uh, relate to aggressiveness of the tumor and or response to treatment. In other words, based on the data, black women had the lowest prevalence of stage one, that means of the lower stage. And in, st in, in terms of stage four with small tumors, they had the highest prevalence and the tumors and the presentation indicated that the disease was more aggressive. So are these disparities? The analysis focused on differences in clinical and tumor characteristics by race and ethnicity. So the analysis was heavily focused on the biology. And there were some significant differences, absolutely. And specifically indicating that the disease was more aggressive in, in black women. Now, the reasons for these differences could not be ascertained from the data that were analyzed. For instance, about the physician's decision making, we don't know about the specific environment in which the, the healthcare care was, was taking place. So therefore, in this case, this article really points at very specific and remarkable differences between black women and other women in terms of breast cancer. But we don't know with the data that we have whether these are disparities or not. The findings are still very significant and worthwhile to continue studying. The following three examples relate to diabetes in the indigenous populations of the Americas. Anthropo anthropologically, 
it has been accepted that these populations shared common ancestors thousands of years ago. And it has been proposed that unique genetic divergence and admixture has happened across the continent, although some common ancestry may still be present. In the US, American Indians and Alaska Natives are one as one population, as one group, have the highest prevalence of both diagnosed and total diabetes in the US. However, when we look at the prevalence of diabetes about, among American Indians from different regions and compare that prevalence to Alaska Natives, we see some remarkable differences. American Indians from the Southwest that you can see here on the, on the right have the highest prevalence of diabetes. And in the, the Southwest is where the Pima Indians live. On the other hand, we see that Alaska Natives have not only a lower prevalence of diabetes compared to other um, American Indian or other groups, but also among all populations in the US. We see that the prevalence of diabetes among the First Nations in Canada is consistently and significantly higher than the rest of the Canadian population. And we also see that the cumulative incidence of diabetes or the risk of developing diabetes over time is also much, much higher among people from the First Nations compared to the rest of the Canadian population. Now, in Mexico, Central and South America, differences in the prevalence of diabetes among the different indigenous groups have been documented. Some of them with very low, nearly absent diabetes and others with elevated prevalence of diabetes. Are these disparities? Although they share common ancestry and they, these examples really focus on ancestry, there could also be some uh, dif biological differences that we haven't looked at that probably tell about susceptibility to diabetes that are shared among these populations. At the same time, these populations share some social determinants of health that manifest or show up in a different way, but they kind of share a common narrative that most likely has influenced their differences at different degrees. And not only the prevalence as we know it as is now from those examples, but also influenced these populations from generation to generation. These populations have lived and adapted to different environments and geography, like here in the under stressors and social determinants of health. And they also have experienced different interactions with the environment, both positive and negative. And some of them have experienced relocation from their natural or their original habitats access to healthcare and healthcare that incorporates their beliefs, especially beliefs that are protective, varies across populations. And we also need to consider psychosocial factors and spiritual coping mechanisms that are practiced among, among them. In addition, there are other factors outside of health or healthcare that would directly or indirectly influence on health. For example, adequate water systems, safe housing, environmental exposures, education, public policies, political decisions, and others. Hence, the risk of developing a disease or preserving health is not exclusively determined by genetics or ancestry. In this study, investigators re uh, reported trends of acute myocardial infarction for Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal populations in the Northern Territory of Australia. 
And the context for this analysis is that uh, from 1992 to 2004, the incidence of acute MI in Australia dropped for the non-Aboriginal population. But the incidence increased by 50% for the Aboriginal populations. And the survival after uh, acute MI was lower for the Aboriginal populations. Later, from 2007 to 2014, the incidence of acute MI in Australia dropped 66% for the non-Aboriginal uh, population. And this is presumed to be a consequence of in interventions on ischemic heart disease and cardiovascular risk factors. Hence, the authors were very interested in analyzing what the effects over time had been in the Aboriginal populations. The authors analyzed first MI and deaths due to, due to ischemic heart disease in Australia from 1992 to 2014 and compared them among the two population, between the two populations. In this first table, we can see that 44% of the events of the first ever acute MI were experienced by Aboriginal populations. We see that those who left in remote, and that, I'm sorry, that 73% of Aboriginal pop, uh, uh, people or, or persons lived in remote areas. Uh, we saw that, or I, the investigators saw that the pre-hospital or pre-arrival deaths were similar um, among Aboriginal populations and non-Aboriginal populations. Um, now the total deaths were higher for Aboriginal populations uh, than for non-Aboriginal populations. Now further looking at the incidence, this is uh, very um, remarkable. They observed that for Aboriginal populations, the incidence of acute MI actually was pretty high at younger ages that compared to the non-Aboriginal populations. And they remain higher except for the 70 year plus group. In addition to looking at by, by age, they looked by sex and they found that for Aboriginal men and Aboriginal women, the incidence was increasing and later plateaued, but still remained much, much higher for both men and women, uh, Aboriginal men and women compared to non-Aboriginal men and women. In addition, the authors described that mortality due to acute MI was 67% higher for Aboriginal uh, persons. Um, and 72% higher for those who lived in urban and 20% higher for those who lived in remote areas. Aboriginal persons aged 20 to 39 years had eight times greater mortality than non-Aboriginal persons. And Aboriginal persons had a 64 greater likelihood of dying before arriving to the hospital. Are these disparities? Um, it seems like there are. And it seems like obviously there is a difference, a race, ethnicity difference in, in, in the population, at least based on this study. There are clear differences in incidence and survival, although no differences in hospital mortality. And some key questions to ask and answer include whether the cardiovascular risk factors experienced by these two populations are the same? Were they aware, equally aware of these cardiovascular risk factors? Were they uh, receiving similar treatments or similar interventions, prevention? Um, what about medications, nutrition? Um, what other factors could be mediating these differences? 
But most importantly, I think one of the most remarkable findings of this study is the age, the age difference and how early in life Aboriginal persons seem to be experiencing uh, acute myocardial infarction. So these are important questions about not only disparities, but understanding the biology, which could exacerbate disparities. In this other example, investigators examined differences in delivery requiring cesarean section and their associated neonatal outcomes in women born in Finland and women who migrated to Finland. They used a national birth registry and they evaluated data from singleton births that happened between 2004 and 2014. They looked at the rates of cesarean delivery and further analyzed data based on whether they were elective or emergency. And they also evaluated the neonatal outcomes, which included preterm birth, weight at birth, and five minute APGAR score. The total sample that they evaluated had over 380,000 women. Of that sample, 92% were born in Finland or 8% were not born in Finland. They also, they gather from the data set some information about employment, occupation, smoking, BMI, and pre-pregnancy BMI or overweight. And all, they varied across groups. But the most important findings or the main reasons for the analysis are the following. In this figure, they looked at emergency and elective cesarean section. And you can see that Latin American women demonstrated the higher odds for C-section and that South Asian, East Asian, Middle Eastern, and Latin American women had significantly higher odds for emergency C-section compared to women born in Finland. In figure two, we see that Sub-Saharan African and South, and South Asian women had the highest odds for having children with low birth weight compared to other immigrant women and women who were born in Finland. We also see that South Asian women had the highest odds for preterm births. In figure three, we see that children born from South Saharan African, Latin American, and South Asian women had highest odds of five minute low APGAR scores, and that children from Sub Saharan African women had the highest odds of requiring neonatal intensive care unit care. Not shown in these figures is something that the investigators also mentioned in the publication. And is that Sub-Saharan women, uh, African women, sorry, were more likely to have infants who died. The, and the percent is low, is 0.9%, but it was the highest among all women. So are these disparities? The investigators focused on differences by racial and ethnic group and whether these women were born in Finland or outside Finland. So that was the primary comparison point in this analysis. The registry included mother's age, occupation, a country of origin, marital status, and other factors that I mentioned before. However, the authors did not really have access to other and very important information. For example, did they have hypertension, diabetes? What was their nutritional status? In history of previous pregnancies, did they have complications during other pregnancies? And uh, what about prenatal care? Did they receive prenatal care? Did they seek prenatal care? And how often? 
uh, how far did they were they in labor when they arrived to the hospital? The quality of the hospitals, or should we assume that all the hospitals were the same? What about the personnel who who uh, took care of them during the delivery? Complications, other complications during the hospitalization. Um, those are important to know to really understand the, the clinical picture and help predict uh, risk for complications, especially the complications that are analyzed in this publication. We know that 8% of the women in the sample were born outside of Finland. So there is an important aspect of migration, migration history, the reason why they left their countries, the reason why they moved to Finland and what uh, stressors associated to migration were mediating or contributing to the clinical picture that they, they demonstrated. We may think, okay, these are immigrant women, and maybe there are some biological factors mediating the presentation and the complications that the authors analyzed. However, although, although that is true, however, we are talking about women from very different areas around the world. So the likelihood that a common biological denominator is mediating all of them is pretty low, not impossible, but still low. So we have to consider each one, where they come from, their sets of risk factors, in addition to their social determinants of health because those could be mediating underlying disparities that are not obvious. In this other example, is, this is one is from Norway and the investigators examined data on hospitalization, mechanical ventilation and mortality among persons who tested positive to the SARS-CoV-2 virus and by the end of June, 2020. 71% of the individuals that were included in, in this analysis were born in, in Norway and 71% of them, I mean, were infected, were positive for the test. In, in this table the, that collects the main findings, they, the authors reported a much higher rate of hospitalization, use of mechanical ventilation and mortality with male sex, and that you can see there, and also with age. Now, individuals from Africa, Asia, and Latin America, all of them were grouped in, in, in one group, also demonstrated a higher uh, relative um, risk uh, for a hospitalization, mechanical ventilation, mechanical support, I mean, I'm sorry, ventilatory support and mortality. Is this a difference? Oh, very much so. We see that, that these are differences. Are these disparities? We are not sure, but they could be. And compared to those born in Norway, uh, persons from Africa, Asia and Latin America not only it had worse outcomes, as you can see in this table, but the authors also say that they were younger than the other groups. So what is happening? What comorbidities? What health status? What risk factors at home, the built environment, at the workplace? And were these persons confronting? We don't have that uh, from the data that they analyzed, but it seems like also like in the case of uh, uh, for the women who were on, uh, the, in the database from Finland, that in this case, these persons come from different, very different regions in the world. So finding a common biological risk factor, maybe, but there, there are going to be some factors that are going to be unique to the circumstances and the histories of these people. 
And with this, I want to highlight some examples in the literature and in, in science in general uh, about health disparities that could be uh, caused or could be associated with factors that we may not be considering. And let, let me rephrase this. Sometimes when we think about heart failure, for example, we may think about risk factors for heart failure that are common in the country where we work or where we live. But we need to think about risk factors and the endemic factors to the country where our patients come from. And one example is Chagas disease. Chagas is common in Latin America, in some Latin American countries. And this disease has um, gotten some attention in the US and in Europe because of the distinct migration of people from Latin America to those regions, but also because Chagas has some serious clinical, long-term clinical consequences in the cardiovascular system, and also some serious manifest manifestations in children who are born with it. Another example is rheumatic heart disease, which is still very common and prevalent worldwide. And it can also cause heart failure or other manifestations of heart disease. But we may not be thinking about them when we are treating a patient with heart failure, for example. And another example is uh, leprosy can cause peripheral neuropathy that resembles diabetic neuropathy, but we may not consider it in the differential diagnosis. So when we forget or do not know about these factors and about well, for our patient's sake, uh, these conditions may go undiagnosed for a very long time and turn into severe complications and in turn create a disparity. This other example, is about breast cancer. And in this one, the investigators looked at pathological and socioeconomic factors of Hispanic women with diagnosed breast cancer from 2005 to 2010, and this is specifically in the state of California. The investigators found that the odds of triple negative diagnosis increased with decreasing socioeconomic quintile. There was an inverse relationship. More triple negative, that means a tumor that is less uh, responsive to treatment with lower socioeconomic status, up to 42% odds, uh, higher odds. They also found that mor the mortality for all subtypes of cancer increased with decreasing socioeconomic status, up to 76% and that the mortality was three to four, uh, four times higher with a specific um, pathology and, and presence of receptors in, in these women. And in this graph that uh, is shown on the right, you see how the mortality, the mortality curve related to the specific type of tumor with the presence or absence of receptors and how for the triple negative mortality, it was the most significantly, there was an inverse a significant relationship. So are these disparities? Well, in this particular study, in reality, they are not comparing to other groups or uh, to other race, ethnic groups, I should say, but they are really comparing uh, with social economic status. So the, the authors are really providing additional information on how the pathology of a disease could vary according to socioeconomic status. And 
and what factors could be um, influencing this. At first, at, or at first glance, the analysis is highly focused on biological factors, on different tumors, but also they emphasize the social determinants of health. And maybe in the database, there was not, info there was not information about stress, stressors, the chronicity of stress, chronicity of poverty, um, family history of poverty, for example, or even um, coping mechanisms in the, in, in the family. Um, there could have been some differences in healthcare that was received by these women or sought by these women. So there are other factors that could have influenced the, the findings. Nonetheless, is a, a very important example of the relationship between biology and the environment.